Ladies and gentlemen, the session will begin shortly. Thank you for your patience. Three years ago, the landmark Paris Agreement was adopted by 195 countries who agreed to limit global warming to no more than 2 degrees Celsius above pre-industrial levels. However, in addition to the challenge posed by President Trump's decision to withdraw from the agreement, the global community is facing serious challenges in mobilizing the investments required for the poorest and most vulnerable countries to cope with the adverse effects of climate change as well as carry out the mitigation measures set out in the agreement. What are the drivers of climate finance effectiveness? What opportunities exist in terms of innovative instruments such as green credit lines and risk-sharing instruments? What role can South-South cooperation play in advancing the fight against climate change? Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome back to the stage our moderator for this session, consultant and career broadcast journalist, Udwak Amimo. Thank you. <clears throat> Good morning, everyone. The room suggests that people are struggling to wake up and uh, juggle uh, late night dinners and conversations with early morning attentiveness um, to important discussions. But thank you very much for being here. Thank you for making it. Um, may I ask you to do us a favor? Could you please move forward um, for the sake of the camera so we don't expose our colleagues who might still be struggling to wake up? So just, you know, fill up the seats in front um, so that uh, in terms of the video recording, um, we, we manage our public relations and reputation. 
as a convening of serious intellectuals who are able to burn the candle at both ends without suffering. Thank you. I appreciate that. Thank you very much. So look, it's an important conversation we're having this morning, um, and it's a pleasure to be your moderator, to join you once again, um, that we're discussing the challenges of mobilizing finances to fight climate change in the South. Um, is not surprising, forgive me for my cynicism. Um, there are different climate agendas um, at play, as we all know. So what we will attempt to do over the next hour or so is to find ways of solving the problem with our esteemed panelists, some of whom are flying in from COP24 to join us. Um, I'll begin with Madame Josefa Sacco, uh, the Commissioner for Rural Economy and Agriculture at the African Union Commission in Angola. Welcome. Thank you. The African Union Commission, Commi Commi yes, yeah, sorry, she's an Angolan. Thank you. Um, next, we'll uh, have... Um, Mr. Teruburo Sito, the extraordinary and plenipotentiary permanent representative to the UN uh, and the former president of the Republic of Kiribati. <clears throat> I will now call Mr. Andre Kaye, the board member at Junex in Canada. former president of the World Energy Congress. And completing the lineup of the panel, uh, we have Andreas Kramer, who's the founder and chairman of the Ecologic Institute based in Germany, among several other distinctions. Thank you. So um, I'd like to take your pulse this morning before we start. Um, and I have a question for you. So please take out your phones uh, and go to your AD Connect uh, app. And the question for you is, is the global south doing enough? And the question will be mounted um, on your screens. Is the global south doing enough to mobilize finances to address climate change? And you have 15 seconds to vote. Is the Global South doing enough to mobilize finances to address climate change? Yes or no? Let's see where we are. Oh, wow, no. 91.7 percent. Uh, uh, there's a great deal of uh, pessimism in this room, panelists, and you have to address that. And I'll start with Kiribati because uh, you are a country that lies just several meters above sea level. Are we serious, um, given that uh, your country is threatened with uh, eradication from the face of the globe in just a couple of years if we continue as we are? Well, thank you, uh, um, moderator, Madam Moderator, and thank you uh, to the Atlantic uh, Dialogue uh, organizers, the, the, the government people, Majesty of Morocco. Thank you. Thank you for this uh, great opportunity for me to be part of this panel. And as regards the first question, is the Global South doing enough to mobilize finances to address climate change? It's a yes and no for me. Uh, there is the uh, definition of climate uh, finance, which uh, requires, uh, one definition requires the south, countries in the South, developing countries like mine, to, to, to organize their own financing. You know, each country has its own money, has its own revenues, and they should be able to, and I think uh, many of us in the South and in the Pacific, I can see that there is this tendency not to make provision. They've got money, they've got surplus revenue, sometimes they, they put it in the bank, sometimes trust fund, but they wouldn't commit it to climate fund, climate uh, change. Why? Because there is this narrative. It's not our responsibility. 
We didn't uh, create climate change. It's created by people out there. So the people out there should, should, be doing, should be creating the money, but not us. So that is the narrative which I think, yeah, in a sense we can provide more. But at the same time, we are not because of the narrative, because of the mindset. We carry the mindset that there are people out there who are responsible. And therefore, they're responsible. They've got to pay. They've got to give us the money. We don't have to ask. We don't have to beg. It's their you know, duty. It's their liability. You know, if you like. this, these are the, the mindset. And I think we need to overcome that because otherwise there's a divide. So the mindset suggests then that we're not serious about uh, fighting climate change. We're not serious about mobilizing finances. That is right. But I must say that in the case of my country, because you're saying that I want to, uh, maybe we are about to, uh, to disappear according to, you know, science uh, reporting and media. But we're not. We're fighting. We can tell you. And that is why the government has set up a program and to finance it with its own money and then call on monies from outside. Because we are serious, because we think we're being threatened. Our survival is on the line, and that is why we're serious, we're going into it. But we can see some of our friends around the world in the South, they keep telling me, you know, you're not supposed to do it. In New York, I hear some of these people, yeah, that's not your responsibility. You, you, you demand it. So there is this uh, discussion about, you know, the, 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 the damage, the, and the, what, do you, what do you call it, the, 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 the you know, the narrative of uh, claiming it in, 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 you know, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it is the duty of uh, these uh, Western developed countries uh, to, to provide finance and to bring it to us. Mm -hmm. So that is, that is how I see that at the moment. Okay, so I'll ask a friend from the South, Madam Sacco. Um, what is the problem? Is it that our ambitions are not bold enough? Is it the mindset? As Mr. Tito suggests, you know, what's going on? Thank you for giving me the floor. Good morning, every one of you. I would first of all like to thank uh, the Atlantic Dialogue uh, for the opportunity accorded to the African Union Commission and myself to be present in this important panel to uh, have a conversation on the climate finance, which we believe it is very important. Uh, climate change, it is uh, an existential, it is an, an, an existential uh, threat, both to humankind as well as uh, uh, the ecosystem that we all depend. And knowing that uh, the developing countries are really dependent on this ecosystem, and that is where uh, we have more, uh, more impact, you know, on these, uh, the climate change uh, related shocks and uh, disasters. That is why our ambition in terms of, uh, uh, our ambition in terms of uh, the compliment of uh, uh, the Paris Agreement, it's very bold. We have, uh, Africa uh, had uh, 84 countries that uh, sign and ratify the Paris Agreement. What we want today is to implement the Paris Agreement. Paris Agreement was adopted in, in 2015. I'm just coming from Katowice, and all of us were saying three years after, what is happening? And we know that uh, climate change is really an issue. The intensity of the disasters are really very current now, so we need to make action if, if we really want to mitigate the effect of climate change. And in Africa, we, have, uh, we are ready to implement, but the problem, it is the finance. That is why this panel is very important, and I had to interrupt my, my trip in Katowice and come here and talk about the finance, because we have our NDCs ready, the National Determined Contribution. It's ready for implementation, and <coughs> I commend our governments, because we are spending 2% of our GDP on adaptation action in Africa. This 2% is really putting, is threatening the development of sustainable development agenda, as well as our agenda 2063. We are having a lot of problem to implement because 2%, we are investing it on the adaptation programs. And we believe that Africa has only 4% of you know, part of the emissions. So we are not part of it, we so are So Madam victim. Sarko, you're just highlighting, you're, you're supporting the point Mr. Tito makes, which is that this is not a problem that the South created, 
And so therefore we want the financing. And yet when you saw the voting, um, the people in this room think that uh, the global south is not doing enough to mobilize finances. And so there's a, there's a mindset problem, no, isn't there? We, we, are, we are in the framework of negotiation parts. That's why We're we have the, the COP. And during the COP, we are just telling you know, our partners from the northern part, from the western part, to comply with their obligation. We were in Paris. They committed themselves you know, to raise about uh, $100 billion before 2020. And you know, we're just telling them to comply with it because they are responsible for the total emission, the global emission. So we, we, we're just negotiating. But even though, you know, I don't agree what uh, the, the general public is saying, even though we in Africa, we are putting 2% of our GDP on adaptations action. So we, I commend, we are really conscious that uh, we need to do something. We have, 40, we, we have 48 countries that ratify you know, the Paris Agreement. We even have the African, in, uh, initiative, uh, African Adaptation Initiative. And Morocco is really give, the, making the, the, the leadership with African agriculture adaptation because the Paris Agreement did not take into account the issue of agriculture. And we know that agriculture is the main uh, uh, sector concern about the degradation of uh, climate change. So it's really <coughs> impacted. That's why we are we really working. And in Morocco, during the COP uh, 20, here in Marrakech, during COP uh, 20, 20, 20, 22, 20, 22? Uh, we create, we, we Africans, we create three climate com commissions. So we have the commission for the Sahel, because of the land degradation in the Sahel. We have the commission of the uh, Congo Basin to, to preserve the second most important uh, 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 reserve on the, on the, on the globe, the, the Congo uh, uh, Basin. And we have the islands, island state you know, uh, commission. Those commissions, we are trying to institutionalize the commission and operationalize in order to comply on our own part of preserving, preserving the planet for the future generation. Okay. Um, audience, I'd just like to point out that you can use your AD Connect to send questions um, uh, while the conversation is ongoing, even as I come back to you to, to solicit your opinions um, on other matters. Um, I'll come to you, Andres, because uh, Madame Sacco mentioned a couple of figures. Um, can you give us an overview of where we are in terms of climate financing, the funds available, um, and what's going to the south, to, to the best of your ability? Uh, to the best of my ability in a short moment. Um, uh, now, the um, one thing I think is important to recognize is that um, uh, Madame Sacco was talking about adaptation. In the north, most of the idea of what we need to finance is a restructuring, a transformation of the energy system, of the transport system. Uh, it's a different objective. It's the objective of mitigation, and we need to do both. We need to uh, mitigate and we need to adapt. If we just do adaptation and still pump oil out of the ground and burn it, then there is no point in, in, in spending the money on adaptation. We need to stop the burning of fossil fuel. Um, the funds available at the moment, um, 2017, was just under uh, $500 billion uh, that were made available in the, in the large envelope of climate finance. I guess that this year it will be uh, a little bit higher. Uh, it tends to go up over time, even though with crises and with changing um, uh, commitments, uh, it can go up and down a little bit. The money is um, uh, not sufficient at the moment, but this is in large part because the um, climate finance has to work against the vested interests of the fossil industry, of the institutional inertia that exists in so many countries that simply can't break the path dependency of their energy systems, and they have to work against the perverse um, subsidies and privileges that these energies still enjoy. So a lot of the, um, not a lot, but a large part of the um, um, uh, climate finance is actually in order to subsidize, to support um, the flow of money into climate adaptation, but also into mitigation, 
that is unnecessarily difficult because of regulatory constraints, but also because of all the privileges um, and the mindset that people have still favoring um, uh, fossil energy. Mm. Just to put a very strong point on that, in most parts of the world today, it is cheaper to build onshore wind turbines and connect them to the grid and supply wind power into the grid. It's cheaper to do that than to keep existing coal-fired power plants running. But that has not sunk in. So, thank you, um, and hopefully it sinks into um, to this room. You talk about the um, amount of funds available. We know that there are several mm -hmm. funds, but we hear that there are problems with absorption. Mm -hmm. We hear that there are problems with even managing the funds. Mm -hmm. I think the Green Climate Fund is in, in, in a bit of crisis, and that was the premier um, vehicle. So if we're talking about mobilizing finances for the South, and we can't even administer those finances, should we even be having this conversation? We should enlarge the conversation because climate finance, the finance is not the problem. There is, we have negative interest rates in large parts of the world. There is more finance floating around than there are projects that could absorb them. That is a general phenomenon all over the world. It's particularly acute in some of the developing countries because you have uh, legal uncertainty, there is political risk, there is difficulty in um, um, enforcing contracts. Um, there are a number of obstacles, institutional obstacles, regulatory obstacles, that stop investors going into those countries. The risk is higher, and therefore the rewards, the profits that they're seeking um, is higher as well. This is nothing that is specific to climate finance. This is also true for development finance for any type of foreign direct investment. Madame Sako wants to intervene, but first, mm -hmm. I'd like to hear from Mr. Kaye, because um, given your background, and you have a fairly interesting background, you've worked within the fossil um, fuels industry, but you've also um, been a steward of the environment. And so from where do you sit, from where you sit, what, where are we going wrong? What is the problem? Because it seems to be a, little, a lot of political horse trading. The problem is, and uh, good morning, madame. <laughs> And good morning to you all. I'm pleased to be here. Uh, the problem is that the, uh, uh, there's a lot of finance, of climate finance, if you like to call it that way, that is present. The, the problem is it's not channeled to fast enough, uh, not to my point of view at least, fast enough to developing countries, especially uh, uh, developing countries in the southern part of Africa. Uh, uh, why is that so? Uh, well, it's uh, because uh, we have difficulty at the global level to put our act together. You see this, see what's going on this week in, uh, in Poland is to try to establish the rules. So if the rules the is rule not book. established, you yeah. can't expect a lot of action from the people, I suppose. Once we do that, and when this is done, I, I think you will see an acceleration. I think, I hope at least, you will see an acceleration, especially in, in the channeling, channeling of money, of finance, to the developing countries. You see, uh, uh, south, uh, southern part of Africa is not responsible for the climate change. Uh, the, their contribution to a uh, global emission is a few percent only. But they, uh, as for the consequences, they leave most of the consequences, especially, especially the people that live in rural uh, agricultural uh, region. They need the funds to adapt, and the funds are not there yet. It has to be accelerated, very much uh, accelerated. It's not the same thing for urban uh, uh, population of uh, Africa because there's the climate finance, of course, but there's also all kinds of multilateral ac activities and bilateral activity. China and the countries, USA and the countries, and uh, uh, climate change fight will not be something else. It's going to something else, something, something that will come outside the actual political equilibrium. It's going to have to live with, uh, with that, like every other human activities. And you're going to see a lot, I think, of these bilateral uh, uh, funding. I hope these go, and it's not looking like they will, 
goes to the people that need uh, the remediation uh, measure. It's much easier for capital, especially for private capital, to invest in urban cities and in urban areas because this, the, the uh, projects are sizable and because they are very much uh, more less uh, risky. Uh, they're not harmed by the, complete, uh, the complicated logistic you will find in rural uh, region of Africa. And by the way, as where also it's the case in Latin America and it's the case also in Asia. So, uh, it remains to be, I'm a, uh, optimistic. I think the, these uh, issues uh, will be resolved and that we will get on with the uh, investment that are needed, not only where the money is raised, but also where uh, the uh, remediation measures are so much uh, needed. Okay, so th there was a significant um, level of pessimism in this room about uh, whether the South is doing enough to mobilize um, finances to fight uh, climate change. And in your previous life, as president of the World Energy Congress, you commissioned some uh, studies into the scenarios around climate financing. And your overarching conclusion was that it's a myth that we cannot um, fund both climate change, climate finance rather, but also um, provide ourselves with energy. Within the context of that work, what do you think the South could do? Because what I'm hearing from everyone here um, translates almost to um, sitting on hands. We didn't cause this problem. You know, we don't see why we need to go out, go out and find the money. You owe us. Um, and so if we were to shift that thinking and forge ahead, regardless of whether people meet their obligations or not, what would that look like? Yeah, I, I think the, uh, it's changing right now the, in the southern hemisphere, changing. I see more and more governments more, more aware and more uh, willing uh, or feel more obliged because of the situation of the populations uh, to take action. They will take action, but uh, again, they will need finance uh, from uh, the, fi the financial uh, communities. And uh, I think this also uh, will come mm -hmm. uh, uh, sooner than people expect uh, today, sooner than the pessimistic pessimistic people do uh, expect. But you know, when I was the chair of the World Energy Council, we uh, were confronted with energy poverty. And energy poverty, of course, at the, during the, that's 15 years ago, energy poverty you find especially in the southern hemisphere. Uh, uh, we have to say that we did not have much success correcting this. But I see a lot of positive with the, this environmental issue and the much more conscientious. You know, people in the North are much more conscious that they are responsible, in fact, for the, the climate change. And uh, uh, energy uh, poverty uh, finally uh, will be uh, uh, tackled, as so will climate issues be tackled. And you will see uh, remediation uh, measure. We, are, we already see new technologies, uh, the renewables, the wind, the solar energy, the large battery, large scale batteries that can be coupled with the, the uh, boat uh, uh, that can provide system, energy, small energy system that will be able to, uh, to uh, meet the needs of uh, rural uh, uh, people living in the southern uh, hemisphere. Uh, okay. I will pledge that this uh, pa additional power should be used for uh, irrigation and refrigeration, because at the same time, we'll, you will fight climate change, energy poverty, and you will enforce the fight against, against uh, for, for food security. Okay, thank you. Madam uh, Sacco, you've got um, several questions coming um, in for you. Uh, my friend Mubarak, uh, why is the African Union Commission not designing model <coughs> projects for African countries to submit proposals for climate finance? If you just look on the screen. Yes, uh, indeed, that's a question, but uh, 
as I said at, at, at the beginning, that uh, we have some initiatives and we have our NDCs. And we are already financing, you know, in our own uh, uh, national budget, you know, our GDP. We are already financing some action. So African Union is working. We have the African, initiate, uh, African uh, Adaptation Initiative. This is one of the big projects. The issue is that when we go to the fund, the Green Fund and the Adaptation Fund, they tend to tell us what is priority. But we in Africa, we speak in one voice. Our group of negotiators are very, very strict on what we want. We want adaptation. Give us fund to start with adaptation. Mitigation, we are not saying that we don't want a fund for mitigation because we have the renewable energy initiative. It exists, and the Department of Infrastructure of the African Union is working on that. But the, the, the mainstream, the one that impacts to the rural population where you know, people are really suffering from the impact of uh, climate change is adaptation. Right now, we are ready for adaptation. Let's start, let's start moving now, you know, and then we we'll see in future if we can go to mitigation. Mm -hmm. But adaptation, and we have two initiatives. And we also have these three basins, uh, the three commissions on climate that we set up. So we are working, we are really working. The environment department on the uh, African Union is a very active department. Because we coordinate the action of the 55 African countries. So we are really working. So I can answer that maybe uh, there is a, a, a gap on communication of what we're doing. But it is known, even my, my, my friend here, my colleague, said that Africans are coordinated. This is in New York. And he knows the way Africans stand for one position. And our position is well known. To, to, to approve all the initiative, we have the, uh, a, a, the triple A initiative. We want finance for this triple A. So we are really clear on what we want. And what we are asking, even in Katowice, is the implementation of our NDCs. The documents are there. The colleagues say that we don't have project. Maybe the northern countries don't have project, the, the developed country. We have projects. Because all the 55 countries of 54 countries have their NDCs ready <laughs> for implementation. Okay, thank you. And um, I, will, I will just want to, right, to talk about the finance, you know, the way we are discriminated in the South. Because from the Green Fund, you know, there was a disbursement of 1.6 billion, and Africa got only 36% out of that amount. And we are 54, 55 countries in Africa. What should we have gotten? Yeah? What did we want? What should we have gotten? At least half of it, because they are we are the majority. We have the adapt adaptation fund that was approved. And under the adaptation fund, Africa got only 32%. So saying that you know, we are not getting enough of these funds, you know, and the fund maybe they are directed to the uh, renewable energy, uh, than mitigation, than adaptation. So there is a, a this, this, you know, displacement in, in, in this, you know, in this type of uh, treatment. So we are just asking. We, it's a negotiation. We are not pleading. We are saying, okay, we agreed under the Paris Agreement. Now let us play our role. Let us do our part. Mm -hmm. We are doing our part. The, the northern country or the developed country should do their part too, so that we can say that a Paris Agreement is not a dream, it's a reality. Mm -hmm. So you started to answer the question that was asked there, which is, don't you think that the Climate Fund constrains the development of the South? This was sent by an anonymous. You didn't put your name. I'm struggling to understand your question and whether you mean whether climate financing constrains the development of the South or whether you mean the Green Climate Fund. So if you could refine that question and send it so we can uh, um, uh, address it. But now I'd like to come to you because um, I see that you know, there are people who want to ask questions and I will give you the opportunity to um, ask questions in a minute. Given that you think that the Global South is not doing enough to mobilize uh, funding, um, please take out your um, phones, your go to AD Connect. And the question I'd like to ask you is this. What should countries in the global south focus on, and, and that will be on your screens in a minute, what should countries in the global south focus on as they seek out financing for climate change? If we could have the question on the, um, um, on the screens. 
the word cloud question, which is what should countries in the global south focus on <coughs> unless uh, the uh, app is not with us? Could you let me know? Okay, thank you. What should countries in the global south focus on as they seek out financing for climate change? And so just key in your ideas, you know, issues, words, you know, what are we missing? Um, adaptation? Okay. Wow, adaptation. <coughs> Adaptation. <laughs> okay, water investment, good projects, bankable, bilateral uh, agreements, projects, collectivism, water, mitigation. Okay, we're just about to close on this. Pipelines. Um, Andreas, I'll come to you um, because I think you'd wanted to chip in on the financing. But what do you make of this? Um, that even as we complain, and Madame Sacco has articulated that most eloquently, um, that there's quite a bit going on, but the rest of the world is not meeting its obligations under the Paris Agreement. And yet there seems to be this focus on adaptation. So there's a mismatch between the African position and the priorities of the financing institutions. And that is exactly what is being discussed in uh, Katowice at the moment. Um, but this is only a small part of it. This is the negotiation between governments about the use of government money from donor countries to recipient countries, which is really only a very small part of what is needed in total. So the words that I like here in the word clouds are projects, pipeline, and bankable. Because ultimately the investment comes in parcels, it needs to be a solar park, it needs to be an electricity connection, it needs to be a biomass plant somewhere. Those are projects. And it only works if the people who implement those projects and the people who finance those projects get to know the rules of the game and they repeat the exercise. So they have many projects in a pipeline. And they need to be bankable. Mm. And, uh, Isn't it's, part it's of the very problem that the because... rules of the game um, for most people in the global south are determined outside of the global south? You determine the functioning of your financial services in your own country yourself. Nobody on the outside determines that. The banking regulation, that's a national thing. This investment security, um, the protection that your courts provide, um, uh, the question whether uh, investors, whether they are Angolans who channel their money through Lisbon and back into Angola, or whether it is other money, whether profits can leave, dividends can be paid into bank accounts out of the country, currency controls, all of that is determined by each African nation, each developing country itself. That is in your hands. Uh, there's a question here, um, and, I, and I'll expand it to the global south, and I'll address it to Mr. Sito. Uh, can African states, uh, countries in the global south, which are rich in natural resources but in need of development, pressure foreign actors, such as by limiting the supply of raw materials or employment opportunities for foreign labor to limit their own emissions back home? And this speaks to the bargaining position of uh, countries in the global south. Yes, uh, as I mentioned earlier, I mean, there is still uh, more to be done by the, uh, the countries in the South to really organize themselves, to believe that this is n not a problem to be pushed uh, to people out there, but it's something that they should take charge of, take ownership of, and be in control and be coordinating and have set up a system which they can control and then bring funds from outside. Climate, green climate, uh, <coughs> GF funds, other climate uh, related funds from the world. Put them in one basket and manage it well. And if they uh, need the management uh, capacity, they can also ask for it through that fund. And, uh, and so we need the South to do that. And at the same time, we need the people in the north to be serious and committed, like the people in the south. 
But if one side is committed and the other is sort of uh, not committed, then we're not going to move forward. There's always going to be a gap. There's always something. It's like a team that is not organized. We will never score. We will never win. We will, you know, be held back together. So that's the way I see it. Okay. Uh, um, Mr. Kaye, you'd started talking about, you know, bilateral and multilateral agreements, and that features quite prominently on the word cloud. Um, what opportunities do you see existing for in, uh, innovation uh, in this uh, space? Uh, you know, innovative instruments, whether you're talking about other uh, green um, um, funds, you know, risk sharing, what would that look like? It's in the South, electrification, access to electricity. Uh, is the a key looking at all of uh, those uh, issues. In, uh, if we are talking about projects expanding grids already existing in urban uh, area, uh, I think uh, they can easily be made bankable. You can easily find an equilibrium between private and public uh, money, just as we, you would find in the northern hemisphere. Uh, uh, and bilateralism is, uh, uh, is very, uh, in most of the time, uh, 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 interested by these types of uh, development, these types of projects. Uh, again, you will see the, uh, either Russia or, or the United States step in and uh, uh, propose their entrepreneurs, their, their equipment, and so on. These will go. Where there's an action to be, to be uh, taken by uh, uh, Southern uh, government is uh, the situation being very different for small projects. Uh, they don't have the size to be bankable. And moreover, they represent a greater risk. So what the... Uh, uh, the southern uh, governments have to do is to aggregate those mini, they call, they're called mini grids project, to aggregate them, to uh, 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 gather the size that will be inter interesting for the uh, finance community. Okay? And, uh, and at the same time, it will reduce the risk because the risk, uh, financial risk will be supported by many uh, uh, small uh, projects. Uh, I read this week that uh, uh, the uh, promoters of these small uh, mini grids project are prepared to make room for local communities in the equity of the project. This is very important, I think. It would be a very, good, a very big plus because uh, the small the people living in small uh, community will be, will be able <laughs> to take ownership for the, the project. And this also is very, very important because it will reduce the risk and therefore attracts the financial uh, community. Okay, thank you. Um, I'd like to open up the floor to questions. Um, so if you've got questions, we've got people with microphones. <laughs> Um, uh, okay, um, so the gentleman, can I just check, are there any emerging leaders in this room? Thank you. Not at the moment, it's too early. Okay. It's working? <laughs> yes. Uh, well, my name is Daniel Naon. Uh, I would like to give you the point of view of a scientific uh, person. Uh, um, Please make it as brief as you can. But, but it's easier for me to speak in French. Okay. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Uh, je suis un géochimiste des sols. Et j'ai été président du CIRAD. Et j'ai été directeur général de la recherche et de la technologie en France. Il y a quatre remarques que je voudrais faire. La première c'est que, vous le savez, l'Arctique n'est là que depuis 2,5 millions d'années et que nous avons déjà connu des réchauffements naturels, bien sûr. Il y a depuis 3500 ans un réchauffement naturel, un fonds de réchauffement naturel qui a été considérablement exacerbé par l'action de l'homme. Il n'y a aucun doute là-dessus. 
Ce qu'on dit le moins souvent, c'est que quand, ça c'est ma deuxième remarque, si on a une augmentation maximale de 2 degrés Celsius, cela signifie que c'est une moyenne. Or, la molécule d'eau a ce qu'on appelle la chaleur latente de l'eau, fait qu'elle est tout à fait différente des continents. Quand l'été, vous êtes sur une plage et que vous voulez aller vous baigner, vous courez sur le sable parce qu'il est brûlant. Ce qui veut dire que lorsqu'on... Monsieur, je vais juste interrompre. Qu'est-ce que votre perspective a à voir avec le financement climatique dans le Sorry, what? What does your perspective? Je vais vous le dire. Okay, Je vais so vous le dire. Parce que, un, ça veut dire que lorsque vous aurez un réchauffement global de 2 degrés Celsius, les terres auront réchauffé de 8 degrés Celsius. Ça veut dire que les grands enjeux financiers du réchauffement climatique seront l'agriculture et l'eau. Et que, c'est ma troisième remarque, il faudra nourrir la planète. Donc les financements sont à revoir en fonction de cela. Le troisième point, c'est que l'agriculture se dégrade à cause des bad practices et des misuses et qu'on perd à peu près 10 à 20 millions de terres arables chaque année. Okay. Et il nous reste entre 600 et 900 millions d'hectares de terres okay. arables. Thank you, thank you very much. Dernier, uh, dernier truc. No, no, sorry. Montrer... We have to give the microphone to other people. Thank you. No, no. So, sorry. J'ai un quatrième point qui est important pour vous montrer que le financement ne peut pas être conçu parce que le réchauffement n'est pas une fonction linéaire, madame. On ne sait pas quelles vont être les rétroactions. Je vous donne un genre de rétroaction. Rétroaction, si on fond toutes les glaces du pôle Nord, nous allons avoir des... des des masses considérables d'eau froide et lourde qui vont aller au fond des océans et qui vont changer les courants. Nous ne sommes pas sûrs que le Gulf Stream restera là où il est. Ce qui veut dire que nous risquons d'avoir, dans l'Europe occidentale, des hivers excessivement froids. Voilà, madame, quelques exemples qui devraient aider à réfléchir sur le financement du réchauffement global. Thank you. Um, but we are discussing climate financing in the South. Um, so if we could um, ensure that uh, we keep ourselves um, to the topic of the uh, session. Um, uh, thank you. Um, there were questions on this end? Uh, yes, 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 thank you. So Mubarak is... Uh... Yes, but... I will come back to the question I just asked on the screen uh, for the African Union Commission. Uh, because now NEPAT is part of the AUC. It's no longer an agency. That's why uh, more than just having policy document and position at the international arena, I think the African Union Commission should sometime develop practical things. That's why I was asking, because me, I'm from Senegal. We are not using climate finance for now. I think there is only one, one big project we are implementing, and it's, it was not initiated by Senegal. So my proposal is if you can design model project, different sectors, and you share it with countries, I think this can accelerate uh, the submission of project. Thank you. Thank you. Please pass the microphone to the front. Yes, I see you. Uh, thank you. Uh, before and uh, less, we all have different roles. So what happened just now is good to give the moderator the chance to moderate the section. Having said that, uh, why it's true that we contribute or are responsible for 4%, you know, of emission globally. But let us not see it from that perspective. Let us see it as a responsibility from the South. Liberia, for instance, uh, the world was not responsible for Ebola going to my country, but yet the world contributed, and today we are out of that. So when we see it from that perspective and know that as a global village, we will then be able to 
But with respect to financing, there is capacity problem as it relates to the soft soft. So from that perspective, we can then, of course, uh, plead with our colleagues from the west or from the north to be able to who have more of opportunity to contribute more. Thank you. Thank you. Um, sorry, if you could pass the microphone to you. Thank you. Uh, well, what I want to say is that uh, Africa can also take its destiny in its own hands. I mean, uh, look at Morocco under the leadership of King Mohammed VI, who has a real vision uh, for the country. Morocco has a very small footprint, uh, carbon footprint in the world, right? Yet, we are engaged in a very ambitious program to uh, uh, develop renewable energies, uh, wind and solar and hydro. By the year 2030, the objective of Morocco under the leadership of, of His uh, Majesty is to produce 52% of its energy from renewable sources. And we, we could find the finance uh, around the world to, to, to finance such uh, ambitious projects. So I, I am submitting that Africa should not just wait uh, for the North basically to become aware of the issue and, 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 and channel funds. Africa should take its own destiny, its own hands, and, uh, and move forward. Mm -hmm. In Morocco, we have now five green bonds who have been issued by banks and also by the Moroccan Agency for Solar Energy. Uh, so we're also using uh, innovative uh, financing schemes to finance uh, these uh, projects. Mm -hmm. the, th the same could be done uh, for the rest of the continent. Mm -hmm. And we have launched during the COP22 the Marrakesh Pledge, which is uh, a pledge by exchanges. I am myself the uh, CEO of Casablanca Stock Exchange, and I'm also the president of the African Securities Exchanges Association. We launched the uh, uh, pledge, all, all exchanges in Africa, and also regulators, uh, to promote uh, green finance. Uh, so this, uh, there are ongoing things in, on the continent to improve access to green finance. Mm, thank you very thank much, you. sir. Um, yes. Yes, thank you. So it is true that um, countries in the south are also making efforts. A typical example is Nigeria, where we launched the green bonds this year, and it was very successful. And I believe that other countries in the South can as well emulate this. But the blame game will not, come, come, will not stop. It looks like what is happening here is just what happens at the COP. The developing countries keep asking for adaptation, and which is very crucial. Our people are already being affected. They must adapt. We don't have the finance to help with adaptation totally. Even though Nigeria launched the green bonds, it's not enough, right? So, we don't need to be bringing up projects like the UN Red Plus, which is focused too much on mitigation. Okay. Adaptation is key. All right. So, so, so I'll say something. Um, these have been uh, interesting comments. I'll take a few more. Madam Sacco, most of them seem to be um, directed at Madam Sacco who has to leave us to go to the airport. So I will encourage you to be as brief uh, um, and, and to the point so that you can respond to the questions and not miss her flight. Thank you. Kardoudi, Institut Marocain des Relations Internationales. Alors ma question est pour Monsieur Caillé. On sait tous que les États-Unis se sont retirés de l'accord de Paris. Je voudrais savoir quel impact cela peut avoir sur le financement du changement climatique. Merci. Thank you. Um, and sir, you've had your hand up for a while. Can I just check? No more questions, because this will be it for OK, thank you. Saïd Moulin, I'm heading the Moroccan Agency for Energy Efficiency. Thank you. Um, we discussed about all the green financing. We manage in this country to attract green financing for big solar projects or wind projects. The key is how to manage to attract green financing for energy efficiency. Small project. We are helping farmers to switch from diesel pump to solar pumps, for example. To have thousands of small projects, it's more difficult to attract green financing for those 
kind of projects, mm -hmm. how we can develop some, some projects dedicated to that. Thank you. I think you answered that question, Andrew. You talked about aggregation of um, smaller uh, projects. Um, thank you for your questions. Um, I will begin with uh, Andre because there's a specific question for you around the impact of uh, the U.S. withdrawal from the Paris si Accord, permettez, and then we'll go to, yeah. Si vous permettez, je vais répondre en français à une question en français. Allez-y, merci. Alors, euh, euh, le retrait des États-Unis de de, des ententes internationales euh, a pour conséquence le, une contribution euh, moins grande une, de, au niveau du Green Climate euh, Fund, for, insta, euh, for instance. C'est évident qu'il y aura moins d'argent qui iront là-bas. Euh, par ailleurs, euh, je pense que euh, les États-Unis n'ont pas mis le frein sur les ententes bilatérales. Pas plus que les Chinois n'ont mis le frein sur les ententes bilatérales lesquels Chinois n'avaient pas prévu une contribution non plus au uh, Green uh, Climate Fund. Alors, euh, qu'est-ce que ça va faire? Quel est le résultat de cela? L'impact, ce sera que vous allez voir euh, beaucoup plus facilement du financement pour des projets urbains. Encore une fois, parce qu'ils ont la taille, puis parce qu'ils représentent moins de risques. Alors, c'est assez facile pour que ce soit les États-Unis ou les Chinois, d'intéresser des entreprises nationales à investir dans le Sud parce que c'est pour eux, euh, ils vont voir ça comme une expansion des activités de leur, de leur industrie dans le domaine de l'énergie. Il ne sera pas d'impact, je ne pense pas, en ce qui concerne la nature des sources énergétiques euh, utilisées. Ce sera des renouvelables, mais ça va être en banlieue des grandes villes en Afrique, en Asie, en Amérique du Sud. Il n'y a pas que du mauvais là-dedans, il n'y a pas que des choses mauvaises. C'est sûr que le, euh, euh, la pénétration de l'électricité dans les populations du Sud ira plus vite s'il y a des financements pour les projets urbains, parce qu'à l'évidence, on rejoint mon, beaucoup plus de personnes avec moins euh, de financement. La conséquence négative, toutefois, c'est qu'il euh, y aura moins euh, de financement euh, disponible pour euh, les populations isolées, pour les populations rurales. Et, euh, et c'est important non seulement parce que c'est quand même des populations grandes, mais c'est aussi important parce que c'est celles qui ont le plus besoin des mesures de, co de, euh, de correction, de « remediation », comme ils disent en en anglais, si vous voulez. Alors, euh, ça voudra dire quoi? Ça voudra dire que, euh, euh, pour compenser, euh, le Fonds des Nations Unies devra surtout s'adresser aux, aux projets ruraux, parce que les projets urbains vont trouver du financement dans la dynamique géopolitique euh, actuelle. Il ne faut pas oublier que toutes ces actions importantes à l'échelle de l'humanité en termes financiers vont devoir s'inscrire dans le système géopolitique existant. Et il faut aller chercher le mieux de ce système. Alors, moi, je ne je dis pas que je suis contre euh, les interventions des Chinois ou, les, ou des euh, Américains dans des, dans des ententes bilatérales. Je dis que les autres pays devront se concentrer sur ce... Euh, ce, ce qui va être délaissé de cette façon-là, c'est-à-dire les ceux qui seront délaissés de cette façon-là, c'est-à-dire les gens qui habitent dans des zones euh, rurales. Et puis, euh, bah, l'autre chose, c'est qu'il n'y a pas juste quelque chose de négatif ici. Je pense que une organisation comme la, les Nations unies est, est plus susceptible de faire place aux communautés locales okay. dans le, la, la propriété des projets et fait plus faire place également aux organisations nationales dans la propriété des projets, de sorte qu'il y aura appropriation. Excusez la, la longueur de ma réponse, Thank Madame. Uh, Madame Sacco, um, there was a theme running in the mm. questions uh, uh, and comments directed at you, and one of the um, one of the um, themes that were prominent was that there are people and organizations and countries doing innovative things. We heard about the Moroccan example. Um, and, and that serves as a model for South-South cooperation. 
um, even within the AU itself. Um, the Liberian ambassador talked about Ebola, the world mobilized, but it was the African Union that led the mobilization with volunteers and doctors from around the continent. So we do have existing models of South-South cooperation. Why is it that we are still stuck in this space of we only contribute 4%, um, we need you to meet your obligations. If other countries are not meeting their obligations, what can southern countries do on their own? Okay, and I think the point you made was um, uh, uh, um, taking control of um, the southern destiny, I think, is how you phrased it. Why is that such a challenge for us? In terms of the 4% uh, responsibility of Africa, we are not making a problem on the continent. We assume it, we know that we are part of it, and we have to go forward because when we look at the victims every other day in Africa, we need to do something. That is why I say that the African countries are investing 2% of their GDP on these actions. And why can't so, we scale up that investment? Well, 2% is a lot on the, on the GDP, you know, for the, each country is investing at least 2% just for action concerning, uh, but that uh, concerning that adaptation. Money coming from the north. Let me tell you something, because in, in, in some budgets, even agriculture that is the big sector has only 1.5% on the GDP. But here is 2%, it's a lot. This money, we could go through development issues than just rescue, you know, and the response to, uh, to disasters. So we are doing something. We are not waiting. We are not waiting. We had Ebola, for instance. It's not uh, a climate change. But we know we took action at the African Union position. What we are doing now with NEPAD, because NEPAD was mentioned here, we are trying to develop a framework because we don't have a policy framework and strategy framework on climate change in Africa. So we are developing. By next year, that's a good news. I am sharing it with you. We will have our own strategic and polit uh, policy framework on climate change for Africa. From then, then we can develop projects. Because except Africa uh, you know, uh, elaborates its own framework and that make it adopted by the head of state of Africa, we will not go anywhere. So we need to define what is our priority, what do we want on this, uh, on this conversation, on this business of climate change, and then draw the way forward and assist our member countries. That is a step forward that we are doing, and next year we are going to launch, maybe in uh, June, uh, July uh, summit, we are going to launch our own uh, uh, African uh, framework strategy for policies and, uh, and, uh, and uh, strategy. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Andres, did you want to say something? It seemed like you wanted to say something about the innov uh, innovative uh, instruments. Innovative instruments, uh, innovation. First of all, I would like to um, highlight one point, and that is we've heard about agriculture, the importance, and adaptation, and um, uh, adaptation comes in agriculture, comes in forestry, it comes in coastal zone management. All of this is indistinguishable from other development finance and other private in investment in the own economy. At some point, when you talk about adaptation, you cannot distinguish between climate finance and development finance and general investment anymore. That is what makes the um, uh, discussion about climate finance a little bit difficult. And the ring fencing, the climate fin uh, uh, finance subject, is one of the difficulties also for negotiators. But I want to say something positive about innovation and about the financing. One is that we see more and more people taking various technologies and um, adapting them for the specifics of singular markets. Um, there's a cultural context, there's a regulatory context, there is an environmental context in terms of climate, and many of the solutions need to be adapted to the local situation, to the scales that um, uh, projects will have. We see more and more people actually doing that, actively taking technologies from one country where it was tested, adapting it to the others. There's a lot of South-South learning and transfer that is going on. And one other aspect that makes me positive is anywhere in the world, not just in Africa, but also in India, um, uh, in, in Latin America, you can buy kits, a solar panel, a smart energy system, a little bit of storage that helps you to have light, to have refrigeration, to run your um, computer, your cell phone, so that you have access to banking if you have um, access to uh, uh, telephony. Um, you can you can have a simple system that powers a house, a family, 
for about $400. The prices are coming down so fast that it is cheaper now to provide access to modern energy, meaning electricity, to areas that are not served by the grid. It is cheaper now to do that than to bring in the diesel or the kerosene um, uh, for the lamps. Um, and you have a renewable source that is clean. The expenditure that families have, $400 at a time, is so small that it is not captured as investment. It is, looks, to, in the st statistics, like consumption. But it is, in the aggregate, the same as investing in an electricity grid because it provides the same service and even better. What does that do to the amount of money we say we need in the global south for climate finance? A lot less than we thought in the past. The transformation, and this is not just the transformation from the fossil to the renewable system, but this is also providing access to modern forms of, of energy to those people who have not been served before. So this is the access question. This is the cost of doing that is coming down so fast that we can accelerate the process in that direction, have the development objectives and have the climate protect, protection objectives at the same time for a cost that is a lot less than in the past. The difficulty is that this is not something that the traditional financial institutions, the two dozen or so institutions we set up in order to organize the climate finance are set up to do. It's too small for them. We need to strengthen the microfinance institutions, the mutual finance institutions, everywhere around the world. It's the local savings bank where the local savings are recycled to local loans in order to have that small-scale investment at the household level. That is where not, that's not what we'll do in the cities. The cities is a different thing. It will work in the rural areas and it will work in the, in the extended areas of the suburbs. Thank you. So look, we're winding up now, and I'd like to um, end, as we started, by taking your pulse, tracking your opinions. And so please take out your phones, your AD Connect. I'd like you to vote. Um, let us know um, what you think about the question I asked at the beginning. We want to see whether the pessimism has increased uh, or decreased. Is the Global South doing enough to mobilize finances to address climate change? And you have 15 seconds to vote um, on this issue. Is the Global South doing enough to mobilize finances to address climate change? Let's see what that says. <laughs> 91.7. Yeah, yeah, we convinced a few people. You convinced a few people. <laughs> Madam Sacco, you have a lot of work to do. I'm happy I won the election. <laughs> yeah. well, you haven't quite won. <laughs> um, it's come down, but clearly um, there's still high levels of uh, pessimism. Um, and so as we wind up, um, and Andres, you started to get into it. Um, this point of innovation, microfinancing to service uh, rural areas, people who have you know, been left behind. If there was one thing we could do now in terms of uh, addressing um, financing of uh, climate change in, in, in the global south, what would it be for you? For me, as I said, it would be strengthen the microfinance in order to enable more people who are at the margin to invest in those small things so that they can reach their development objective without harming the climate interest. Andreas? I, I would be uh, to connect the uh, different source of uh, financing. You have the green finance funds, you have the multilateral uh, uh, institutions, and then you have the bilaterals. They need to be connected uh, and we'll have a, so that we would have a much better performance because we need my, micro when we need a, a larger uh, uh, instrument as well. Mm -hmm. Mr. Sito. Yes, well, I, I believe that uh, uh, what has been said from, by my colleagues here about you know, the, the need to, uh, uh, to target rural areas and people not having energy now to be able to have energy, affordable energy, I think that is good as a mitigation. But I think adaptation, I would agree with the many arguments, adaptation is really the, the main issue now. So what's the one thing we should do as we go away um, to mobilize finances um, for the Global South? I think we need to work more as the South, 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 there's got to be more, and learn from the example, like Morocco and others, you know, who are talking here 
they are leading the way. We should be you know, connecting with these programs and learning from them and, uh, and be more you know, in charge, be, be take charge, like in Morocco is doing and others in Africa. And I think we should all be doing that. And, and at the same time, challenge the Northern people to, people in the North to do their you know, part of the act, to be honest and to be committed as, as we believe we are. Madam Sacco. For us to have an efficient uh, climate change finance, I think we need to be engaged on uh, climate finance readiness, which has been supported by the green, uh, the, the green Climate Fund as well as the Adaptation Fund. The, this mechanism is very important, the climate uh, finance readiness. This is what uh, is happening now, is the, the way forward for the What mechanism. do you mean by climate finance readiness? It is a mechanism that is set to have access to finance, you know, and it is being supported by the two, inst uh, the, the two funds, both the climate fund, uh, green climate fund, and the adaptation fund. And the second one I would like to really call upon all the participants on this uh, panel to take uh, the, the reports, uh, the reports of 2018 on 1.5 degree, which serves to call our attention, I mean, to call us for really, uh, for action. Otherwise, the, climate, uh, the Paris Agreement will be a dream. And we don't want it to be a dream because yesterday, people at 4 a.m., they're still negotiating the book, the book rule of uh, Katowice. If that one fails, we are going to fail. We have to take our destiny, which is not fair for all of us. Thank you. Thank you, yes, go ahead. <laughs> Um, so look, we've come to the end of this conversation. I'd like to thank you for your kind attention. I'd also like to thank the panelists um, because someone like Madame Sacco, various others flew in just for this. Um, thank you for your insights. You've been most generous with them. Um, and we thank you also for just having the patience to uh, bring us up to speed on where things uh, stand. So we thank you very much for your time on this panel today. It's been an honor and a pleasure being your moderator. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, we will now break for coffee and reconvene at 11 o'clock. We will reconvene at 11 o'clock. Thank you. <laughs>